Yeah, I mean, my concern is that they're just going to cross the river and then take the fort <laughs> without anyone garrisoning it. Yeah. This is for the 10 o'clock move? Yeah, it'll be for the 10-15 report. Got it. Perfect. So as we resolve this combat, if they are positioned the way they are, like, very defensively like that, they should get the plus one, I think, in the center. So we'll, when we get to there, we'll, we'll talk it over, but I think that's how it's going to have to work. I'm Sean Lambert, and if you've never participated in Kriegspiel before, uh, this opening sequence of this video is probably pretty damn confusing. And if you have, then uh, welcome back. This battle is the Battle of Hastenbeck, uh, which took place in July of 1757. This is part of a, a larger series that I've been running in the International Kriegspiel Society called the Seven Years' War series. The whole point of the Seven Years' War series is to try to introduce players to differences between Napoleonic and, and later conflicts and 18th century warfare. And so uh, I've developed a rule set, uh, I've redesigned some pieces, I've been making maps for each battle, um, and the overall goal is to try and get people familiar with 18th century warfare in a kind of fun way uh, but on top of that each scenario itself can teach a lesson uh, that said overall it is still meant to be a fun game uh, but people do take it seriously I take it seriously uh, and so I think it's very useful to look at what happens in the battle afterwards from a high level perspective because uh, when you're playing a battle or or even when you're umpiring a battle you're pretty much zoomed into one piece of what's happening uh, and so i recorded the entire battle as it was going from my perspective but you'll see even my perspective is limited to the fact that i have to zoom in on places like what we're seeing now to resolve combat um, and kind of overall, I don't see all of the orders necessarily, so I don't get the perspective of all of the players, but I do get a wider perspective than a player would get. And obviously I just kind of designed the scenario. Uh, so a little background on the battle here. Hastenbeck is part of the Hanoverian theater of the war where the British and uh, the forces of kind of uh, northern Germany are teamed up and the British strategy uh, led by William Pitt is to kind of drain the resources of France on the continent while England faces them elsewhere in the world such as in North America uh, with the intention of not spending British lives on the continent and using Germans instead. Uh, and, and it's kind of a strategy that leads directly to the strategy of using Hanoverian and Hessian forces in the Revolutionary War against uh, the fledgling United States, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. But to, to know why that happened, you do have to go back to the Seven Years' War to see how that relationship started. And, and really, it's about Britain pouring money and resources into the continent in order to fight the French on the continent instead of having the French be able to commit their full resources to colonial wars. At this point, the colonial side of things isn't going so hot for the British. And in fact, the French are, are actually pretty much able to do what they want in Canada. So the, the, the early 
parts of the war on the continent are very important for the British, just to show that they have some sort of presence there. Um, but the background to this battle is that the French have invaded uh, basically Westphalia and now we're all the way over at the Vesser and the British have been just falling back and falling back and falling back and finally they've decided to take a stand on this very favorable defensive terrain. What they find is that the, although the terrain is very favorable, it is difficult to deploy in such terrain. And so you have this army that's deployed in kind of two pieces. You have the main force around Hastenbeck, and then you have a kind of a separated core. And historically, those became disconnected, and the French were able to split them, which allowed more and more of the uncertainty to start playing into it, which eventually, at the end of the day, caused the British forces to want to withdraw. That said, as they're fighting this battle, the British strategy is really to cause casualties and attrit the enemy, which they succeed in doing. Uh, and so one thing that we didn't talk about as part of the live battle as a victory condition is attriting the enemy forces. Because uh, I, I didn't really want to give that as a goal because the players, I think, should be focused on more of the strategy within the game and not necessarily outside of the game. Uh, but if you were playing an operational game, the point of this battle from the British perspective would be to A, fight the battle on their terms, on their ground, and B, to cause losses for the French forces. And I would say that Overall, the British actually achieved that objective. Uh, you'll see here as we keep going through the, the sped up version of the game that the French start losing a lot of their cavalry. They lose um, uh, a lot of hits on their infantry as the center battle starts. And as the day goes on, they would definitely lose more than they, than they kill. Uh, and the main reason for that is because of the terrain. Yeah, in an intro section here, I did talk about how th as they approach the center line, they're going to be a, the French are going to be at a disadvantage, uh, and that definitely plays into it and is very important. So you'll hear see here as we're going through, the French just took their first loss, and this cavalry charge into these infantry uh, doesn't go so well for the French, although it does kind of lock this British core into place. Now, I, I keep saying British, but again, this is mostly Germans, actually. It's Hanoverian and Hessian forces uh, with a few Brandenburgians and uh, other German states involved, but primarily it's Germans. It's, it's not actual Englishmen. However, it's commanded by the Duke of Cumberland. And uh, obviously it's paid for by the British. So that's, that's the main reason I call it British is because the commander is British. Now that said, uh, I think overall the CIC strategy for the British here, uh, for Cumberland, in the game, as opposed to in real life, is, uh, was pretty risky. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, I think, they have some objectives that we've given that are kind of above and beyond just the operational objective that the British would have. Uh, so if you see those little um, kind of battle markers, like the one that's over Hastenbeck on the screen here, uh, those indicate that those are objective points. And the idea for the British is that they have to hold uh, both Hastenbeck and Vorenberg, and then they have to have, have all three bridge crossings held. And the idea of, of that is if they were to lose the bridge crossings, they would have to withdraw at the end of the day to kind of clean that up and to make sure their lines of communication are held. 
Now, uh, that's a little bit contrived, but um, a normal battle, like a real battle, would obviously not be restricted to the map edges. And so if you allow the French forces to just go on wide flanks and do whatever they want, they can uh, manage to cut off your lines of communication, and that could be really dangerous. In 18th century warfare, and really even modern warfare, holding your supply lines is very, very important. Um, so the fact that the British CIC does not want to protect his rear areas by even just dropping a half battalion back there uh, is pretty risky. So uh, we'll get to it, but one of the major factors in how we adjudicated the outcome of this battle is that initial decision by the CIC to not guard the river crossings was risky and as you'll see with that that wide swinging cavalry force actually just leaves the river crossings open to be able to be crossed we didn't actually get all the way to the point where the french start pouring guys across it uh, but we could see that once they know they're open they would probably start sending troops across in order to you know, block those lines of communication. Overall, I think both sides actually played really, really well for their first time. Most of the players involved in this game, and there were about 41 players, I believe. Uh, so a massive game by our scales. And each player was commanding approximately a division, which uh, didn't really exist at the real battle. But we assigned divisions to brigades and the brigades were numbered uh, arbitrarily. Historically, the brigades were essentially named after the area where the troops were from or by their the funding body that paid for them. So you'll see like the, the Austrian division in the French army is just made up of Austrians, which are the French allies. The British army has almost all their divisions named after their commanders. And for the most part, that would have just gotten very, very confusing. So we just numbered all the brigades and then assigned about two brigades per division. And then the players command a division, which ends up being about eight to 12 pieces. Um, obviously, the cavalry commands are a little bit smaller because those are squadrons but every all the other infantry pieces are half battalions so each of those blocks represents one half battalion and that's kind of the traditional kriegspiel way of designing an order of battle is you you give players half battalions not full battalions and i think that part of this battle actually works really well i think the order of battle uh, was really interesting for the players. Uh, the French have a lot more troops, but they obviously are going into this very difficult terrain, both movement and combat-wise. Um, so it's actually a pretty even battle. Now, historically, what happens at the end of the battle is uh, very common in, in the Seven Years' War. There's not a big, decisive outcome of most battles in the Seven Years' War. No matter how bloody they are, the inability of the so-called victorious force to follow up their victory really means that each battle is kind of independent of the rest of the campaign in some ways. Not in that it doesn't affect anything, but they can't immediately press their success because it is very hard to follow up successful battles and this time period it's all about at the operational level once you win you got to get your your guys back together and organized again and that's really a difficult task and not really one that the the forces especially early in the war are good at and so the results of this are that the overall campaign is still indecisive and in fact, remains indecisive for the majority of the war. Uh, there's 
many battles just like this where the, the forces meet, they shoot at each other, and then they withdraw. And so I think this is also a good example of the Hanoverian theater because it's we didn't really get to that decisive point. And even though tactically you might get to a decisive point within a battle, I think it's important for the players in a 18th century game to experience the indecisive result uh, and to realize that in the larger campaign... This battle is just one piece, and the, the strategy of the British is just to not lose. The strategy of the French is, is not necessarily to commit everything. It's also to just not lose, to help their Austrian allies. Now, obviously, they, they have objectives that they're trying to take, but getting to that point is very challenging for them, and it's not something that they're uh, usually able to do. And so we're quickly reaching kind of the end of the battle here. Uh, you can see that the French have taken a lot of losses, but the line hasn't really moved that much. Uh, and other than that one cavalry uh, brigade swinging around the top, really the battle hasn't reached its full decision point. Um, but that said, the importance of these lines is very important. So we're going to skip ahead a little bit here and see the very end of the battle, kind of from the umpire perspective of why we so called it. So it's five hours now, right? That we have been playing or that the event yeah. has been running? Yeah, I think we're yep. getting to the point where we're going to have to call it, even if it's not... Yeah, I mean, we lost two players already in the center. So I think... Yeah. Let's try to... No, do... I, I think there's also a problem of, like, we have too many people uh, yeah. in, in terms of... I mean, what we could do general. is we could announce a part two on the 28th. Let's say pause it here, don't talk about that it. That would be... Yeah. Because I have an open Saturday already scheduled. It would mean that that's, we would have less That's an option. Time. I'm not a big that's fan, I must option, say, yeah. because like, I don't like that most idea. of the people will probably not come back. And it's going to be frustrating today because they don't get to see what happened and so on. Yeah, well. Mm -hmm. Do we just, I mean, if we're going to call it off, then it would clearly be a French victory because... That left wing is just done. There's no saving the French at uh, the British left wing, the Ang Anglo Ally left wing. There's a, a a force marching up their rear. There is a ton of weight coming straight at them. Alrighty. Hmm. Yeah, I think the operational they, side and would the be, would be French with more reserves. And they didn't garrison their own town or any of their bridge crossings. All right, I think we know enough that we can give a post game after action and it's going to be a quick one. We're not going to go through all the players. Like I No, no. I think we will ask the CICs what they Has the battle already ended? Yeah, we're going to call it here, I, th I think. Um All right. It's I mean, we're 5 hours in and we could probably do this for another 5 hours and still not clear it out completely but i think we kind of know enough about how blue is playing to say that they probably would yeah like a lot of their objectives lose. are unguarded yes. and now that red cavalry is near there and i don't think the blue cavalry will, will be able to like catch up to them to contest them for it and i also think now that the red um, cavalry it's also a fact that the uh, Prussian left has gone out of um, square and they got caught, and they're now being caught out of it. And as the cavalry is charging them, they're trying to form back into square. All right. Yeah, that's not that's not gonna that's not gonna yeah, happen. Yeah, they're forming back into square just as three uh, or four infantry brigades fall on them and start firing. Like they're just absolutely and, and no matter how they like do it. two cavalry brigades in the rear are charging at them. 
yeah, they've got nowhere to go. That whole like I, I think the Prussian left is wiped. already pretty much destroyed. So I do think the battle has kind of already ended. 